In this very special version of 25 Minute Physiology, we're gonna be talking about speed training and specifically the difference between acceleration and maximum velocity. Now, I've been saying this for years, trust me. It's all over podcasts I've been doing since 2002 or something. That's a lie, like 2012 I meant. Nonetheless, but speed training in my opinion is the most forgotten, misunderstood, and just gets the least amount of attention of all the possible training adaptations. I guess it just doesn't sell 24 hour fitness memberships or whatever. It doesn't make you get any likes on Instagram. But this is the area that actually is the most important for performance athletes, and I think is the area that if you spend most or more time in, develop a skill set here, you can become a very valuable practitioner or coach. In any world, right? Even MMA or CrossFit or weightlifting, speed is a component to every basic type of performance. So let's break down the two different types of speed, and then we'll talk about in a second the different ways I think that are best to train. No, I think the science thinks is the best way to train for them. So the first part is acceleration, and that's moving yourself from a stop. Now some sports like tennis are almost entirely acceleration based. So they're never going to reach the opposite, which is maximum velocity or what I'll call top end velocity. That typically is gonna take 15 to 30 meters of movement before you can actually get to. So think about maximum velocity like a 200 meter dash. There's an acceleration phase for the first, again, 20 or 30 meters, depending on the athlete. And then from the rest, it's top maximum velocity, right? What's the highest mile per hour you can hit? That's what we're after. So sports like tennis will never have that distance to cover, so it's almost acceleration the entire time. It's stopping, it's restarting, we're constantly doing that. Sports like basketball are still mostly acceleration. There are some spurts of like a 15 or 20 meter thing, but when the court's only 60 feet or 90 feet long or whatever it is, we're just never really gonna get to max velocity that often. Other sports like football, some positions may see max velocity. Uh, imagine a wide receiver going on a, a, a fly route or a go route. But even still, like an, a linebacker, running back, offensive lineman, it's almost entirely acceleration that they're doing. It's rare that they're gonna sprint more than 20 or 30 straight meters. Okay, a uh, sport like soccer though, can be both and even a lot of top end velocity because they're covering big distances of fairly uninterrupted sprinting, right? Maybe a little bit of weaving and zigging, but a lot of forward sprinting. So now within acceleration, you may be thinking to yourself, uh, well, that's not exactly what I thought acceleration was. I like to split it up into two different categories, change of direction and what we'll call agility. Okay, now change of direction is exactly like you're seeing the picture there, which is sort of like a cone drill or footwork drills, things like that. The difference between that and agility is choice reaction. So this is why a lot of coaches in this area will get really irritated at people who do fast foot drills and fun little things on the beach or in the sand and think they're training acceleration or agility. And it doesn't really do it that well because you really know exactly where you're stepping. The problem with that is, is very low likelihood it's gonna to transfer to sport very much. A hard part about being a faster athlete on the field is you have to not only be able to move at that speed or change direction like that, but you gotta be able to do that when you have decision making and when your foot isn't in the exact right position. This is why people tend to head what's called agility, right? Which is the image there, right? The athlete goes through the ladder as fast as she can, and at the end, whether she breaks right or left is dependent upon where the, athlete, the coach throws the ball. So agility is a little more complex and, and depending on your sport, but most sports are gonna be more aligned upon agility rather than just change of direction. So something like a T test or a pro agility test, it's not incredibly important uh, to understanding say like a football player, but that's why at the NFL combine, they'll also do drills where the athlete has to run at a coach. The coach then points a the direction. They wanna see how quickly they can react when their feet aren't set and how can they get, how quickly can they get to the position. All right, so when it comes to training them, we have got two predominant things we can do or major approaches to it. Most everyone is familiar with, with, with what's called resistance training. Okay, this is really anytime you're adding some resistance to your body. When we tend to think about that, we think about lifting weights and barbells and dumbbells. But in the case of speed, this typically comes in things like dragging sleds or a parachute or having a bungee pull you, maybe doing vertical jumps on a mat with a harness that's pulling you down to the ground. Uh, could be even adding like a medicine ball to a throw or a press or a jump, right? It's adding mass to the system that slows you down a little bit. What people don't necessarily talk a lot about 
is the opposite, which is letting you go faster. We tend to call this assisted or over speed training. Now this is interesting because if I told you I want you to get faster, why would you do something that adds mass to the system that lets you or makes you slow down? Why wouldn't you do something that actually teaches you to go faster than you possibly can? Now there's actually a strong literature or scientific base behind assistance training and it turns out it's incredibly effective. The most common example, imagine doing sprint work like you see in the picture here where you're pulling a sled or having a band pull you and hold you back. The assistance version would be flipped where you have the coach pull you forward. Other ways you could do this, Say your maximum running speed on the track is 15 miles per hour. Well, then maybe you get on a treadmill and set it to 16. Right? Don't set it so much like 2025 where you, you can't even run. Your entire mechanics, your gait are all screwed up. You're just trying not to fall on your face. That's not what we want to get. We want just a little bit of help to help you learn to go a little bit faster. Uh, another example are things like if you swing a baseball bat that's 30 ounces. Practice swinging a wiffle ball bat that's 10 ounces. Learn to move it faster. Don't do it so much again that it screws up the mechanics of your swing, but just a little bit to where you learn to actually go faster. Bands are effective at this. Imagine doing vertical jumps where instead of the bands are holding you to the ground, you have the bands pull you up. So if you can jump 30 inches in the air, normally the band lets you jump 35. Now, of course, if you pay attention to anything I do, I'm not going to tell you one approach resistant or assisted is better than another for speed training. They both have pros and cons. And this is one case actually where the story is pretty damn simple. I'm going to give you that answer in just a second. Which one's better for acceleration? Which one's better for top end velocity? I'm not going to, I'm not going to get a straight give it to you. You got to think. Think about acceleration and think about resistance training for speed and think about assistance training. Which of these would probably improve acceleration the most? Well, what's the problem with acceleration? What do you, what's the biggest hurdle you have to moving faster with acceleration? Well, think about max velocity. Same thing. Which one of these two approaches would be better for max velocity? And if you're critically thinking about this, it's actually nice because the science supports what your gut instincts would tell you. Do you really think that dragging a sled behind me where I'm going slower than I can normally run would help me run at a faster maximum velocity? Well, it turns out it doesn't. But it's actually really good at teaching you to, to accelerate. Why? Because a big part of acceleration is overcoming inertia. So learning to move fast with a little bit of resistance is actually really helpful for acceleration. You want to improve your top end velocity though, you need to incorporate some assistance training. Learn to move faster. Okay, and again, you can look, there's probably been 30 studies, maybe more, published in this area, and if you look at them collectively, that's what it's going to support. Both types of training are good. Of course, incorporate them both. I'm just saying, think about the athlete you're working with or the client you're working with, and think about the demands of their sport. Are they more reliant on acceleration or velocity? Are they equal? Are they 80% velocity, 20% acceleration, or the inverse? Well, then potentially implement these different types of speed training accordingly. I'll give you one really clear example. Uh, my colleague Lee Brown has done a tremendous amount of research in this area. And probably his most iconic study was a wiffle ball bat study. And what he did is he looked at the baseball bat swing. And you've all seen the baseball players in the on-deck circle. They put the donut, right, that heavy circle on their baseball bat. They swing it a few times and it feels really heavy. Take the donut off, swing their bat, and it feels lighter. Well, it turns out not only does that not work, it actually makes the baseball bat slower. But if you swing a wiffle ball bat, which is a light plastic bat, before you swing your baseball bat, although it makes it feel a little bit heavier, it actually lets you swing the bat faster. Right now, Psychology plays into this, and again, you don't want to change the mechanics of something really skill-specific like a baseball swing. So I'm not saying make all your baseball players do wiffle ball bats. I am saying think about it from a conceptual level that don't forget the overspeed or the really fast piece of training. All right, so hopefully I've convinced you, and again, you can look at the literature on that. But what I want to jump to now is actually training recommendations. So I'm going to go through a couple of samples of things you could do 
And we'll start with the acceleration piece. Now, one of my favorite is called dynamic variable resistance, or what some would call compensatory acceleration. Now, the powerlifting community gets the, gets the win for this one. They really popularized it. I'm not sure who invented it. Who knows? But they definitely popularized it. If not invented it. And I'm going to show you some videos of exactly what that looks like in a second. But what's actually kind of happening here is you can see the gentleman squatting. And just the side, Ryan, maybe you can try to highlight that. There are black bands attached to the barbell. Okay, now the bands, if you think about a rubber band, these are not like your TheraBands, like, not your little ones. These are really heavy, thick bands that at the end, when they're stretched to the maximum, are going to add 100, maybe more pounds of force to them. So you attach the bands above, attach them to the barbell, and as you squat down, the bands get really tight, and they're pulling on the barbell. So as you squat down below, what starts happening? The lower and lower you go, the more and more force comes from the band, which means the less and less force is required from you to move the, the barbell up. Okay. So imagine there's 500 pounds in the bar, he squats down, at the very, very bottom, maybe instead of feeling like 500, it feels like 400 because the bands are adding 100 pounds of help because they want to pull up as well. But as he stands up, the bands get less tight and less tight and less tight, so they add less help to the bar. So it's actually 500 pounds of the bar. It feels like 400 at the bottom. As he stands up, it starts feeling like 420, 450, 480. And then to get to the top, he actually has to put 500 pounds of force into that barbell to get it up. Now, any of you that have a strong background in physics or biomechanics, like, don't, don't kill me on exactly here. Think of the concept. But this is what happens, and this is why I'm talking about this in a speed video. This type of training, our laboratory has showed it, and several others, or a few others have as well, but it's not studied incredibly well, it needs more work. But the evidence that's there is pretty clear, as well as the, the training and the anecdote that we've got from a lot of coaches, which is equally important. Okay, but what it shows is this. As you go to move up, because the load on your back gets actually kind of heavier and heavier, so the demands for the mass go up, unlike a normal squat where if it's 500 on your back, it's 500 on your back at the bottom, it's 500 at any place. Here it's not. It gets lighter as you go lower and heavier as you stand up. In order to then move at a normal speed, you actually have to accelerate the whole time. If you don't, you're going to get collapsed by the increase in force production and you won't be able to move the bar. So take a look at the video, and maybe that'll explain a little bit more. So again, the athlete goes down at the bottom. It's feeling a little light at the hole, but as he stands up, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. So he's, again, having to exert more force or more acceleration as he goes up, and you can see the bands there really clearly, to continue to move the bar. That's why we call it compensatory acceleration. You have to compensate for the increase in weight by accelerating through it. Okay, now it's not exactly the physics, but you get the idea. It's also what's called dynamic variable resistance because unlike a normal squat where the resistance is 500 the whole way, in this case, the resistance is variable. It changes throughout the range of motion depending on where you're at. Okay, now, another example you can see here, same thing, uh, but instead of having the band coming from the top to the bottom, it's coming from the ground up, but the same exact thing happens. So as Chris goes to stand up here, the bands get tighter and tighter and tighter, so the weight is heavier at the top than it is at the bottom, okay? Now, there are some differences between having the bands. You can do the same thing with chains. If people have ever seen people squat with heavy chains, same concept here. Okay? And then you'll actually see Chris in a second here do the same thing on a bench press. Again, maybe hopefully, Ryan, you can help me out because the video isn't incredibly easy to see. But the band is attached to, uh, to the ground, and you can see he's going to do some speed reps. So he'll get in a good position, hold it, and he'll kind of fire out five or six reps. And of course, all of you know as well, uh, by taking your shirt off or at least cutting your sleeves off, you add 20 to 30% strength and hypertrophy to your bench press. So make sure you try that tip as well. All right, so again, he holds it down here and then fires up a couple of speed. So he's not going for hypertrophy here. He's not going for fat loss. He's, he's trying to build speed and power. Powerlifting community crushed it with this, did a great job uh, identifying how to implement these things and the science is coming through to support what they've originally argued. Uh, very good for acceleration, very good for power, and a little bit of speed development as well. Now, the other piece that I'll say to compensatory acceleration. 
I believe it's very good from a transfer to sport perspective. Here's what I mean. If you do a normal bench press, when you get to the end range of motion, you actually have to decelerate. Because if not, the bar would leave your hand. But in sport, that's a terrible idea. Imagine if you go to strike somebody in a football game and you build up a lot of force and acceleration and right as you get closer, you start to slow down. You'd be the worst player ever. You can, you'd constantly lose every exchange. You want to actually accelerate through the individual. Same thing if I'm punching an opponent. If I'm doing a vertical jump, I want to have the most acceleration at the end to go through contact. But normal resistance training actually teaches the opposite, to slow down at the end range of motion. By adding a band or a chain, I don't have to worry about that because it's going to be the heaviest at the top, so I'm going to finish through the range of motion. I'm going to finish through the range of motion or through the range of motion if I'm deadlifting with it or whatever I'm doing. So I really like that from a conceptual model. I, we don't have any literature that suggests it makes people better uh, on, the, on the field. That's always a very hard thing to demonstrate. But it does show that it's more effective for improving power and speed. I also think that athletes tend to feel better because they feel that acceleration through. So I believe there would be some support there, although, again, albeit no signs per se. So that's compensatory acceleration. I think a very good tactic for acceleration training. Giving you one tip here on the maximum velocity. I told you the overspeed or assisted stuff is a little bit better for that, so I'll show you a few examples. You can imagine. Um, Instead of pulling a sled, you have some coach pull you. Very, very good there. But here's a video of somebody actually doing it with the vertical jump. So you see the harness is pulling the athlete up in the air. And instead of being able to jump 30 inches normally, if that's his maximum height, he can now jump 35 or whatever it happens to be. All right, so again, a lot of evidence and a lot of research to support that that's a pretty good training tactic. So I hope you learned a little bit about speed training today. Uh, make sure to comment below if you want more speed training videos. I haven't done a lot of them. I'm kind of kicking myself, but this is an area, again, I'm actually more excited about than hypertrophy and fat loss. That, this stuff doesn't jazz me as much. This stuff is much more important for an athlete and a gap there. Again, uh, you know why I do these videos. Uh, if, you come to, if you're in class, come to class with some, next class with some questions. We're going to go do some of this stuff outside anyways, or we've already done it, one of the two. But any support is always appreciated. Until next time, we'll see you.